Hey everybody, good night. It's Bill from the Edge of Eternity. Sunday night service in the garage. Hey, before we get started with the actual uh, lesson that we're going to go through tonight, I want to say just a couple of things. Number one, this is sponsored by Outlaw Customs. Arco, thank you very much. He sent me this shirt this week and I really appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate all my friends on here. But Arco, uh, thank you for bringing us all together. And make sure you check out Arco's channel. Uh, it's great. And uh, he and Heidi are both wonderful. And I really appreciate them both. So thank you for the shirt. And uh, everybody check them out, okay? Also, in the uh, description of this video, you will find all my friends that I support. And I'd like you to check them out and support them as well. Whether it's uh, supporting them through a Patreon account or anything like that, PayPal, or simply just watching and liking their videos. There's a lot of really good content that uh, we all really enjoy. So I hope you all get a chance to check them out and uh, support one another here. Okay, I'm going to have a quick prayer and then we'll get right into this tonight. Lord, I thank you for giving us a chance to meet again and uh, have church in the garage. I appreciate the people who come and watch this, and I just ask you to bless them. Be with us now as we look at what you're doing in this world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's get going. Now, <clears throat> we recently went through the uh, seven seals. Remember those seven judgments? They came on a scroll that was sealed with seven seals. And God the Father handed that over to Jesus, his son, because he was the only one allowed to open the seals. And he did those one at a time. And they all showed us um, judgments that will be taking place on the earth. Now, we're beginning to see these things that are discussed in the book of Revelation. When we get to chapter 8, which we went through, we open that chapter, and the Bible says, and there was silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour. Dead silence. That was a uh, time of solemnness because so many of the judgments were revealed and the people in heaven saw how um, devastating it was going to be to the world. So with that little interlude in the beginning of chapter 8, I wanted to take a short interlude and tell you about what's going on in the world today because so much of it is uh, related to what we're studying, okay? Now, about 2,600 years ago, um, Israel was kicked out of their land, and they haven't had that land ever since until May 14th, 1948. That was a very momentous day in Bible prophecy because as we look at this lesson tonight, we're going to be talking about Ezekiel chapter 38, and in that is described um, the war of Gog and Magog. Now, chapter 36 and 37, right before that, talked about Israel being restored. And um, God says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, do you think these dry bones can live again? And God had taken him to this valley and showed him all these dried bones that had just been dyed and were dusty and dirty and just uh, had been gone for a long time. And Ezekiel says, well, Lord, you're the only one who knows that. So the Lord gave him this vision and he told Ezekiel to tell these bones to come to life and to get up. And skin began to form on them and ligaments and tendons and all the body parts and everything. And then he said, God is going to breathe life into these bones and revive them. And these bones represented the nation of Israel being gone. This has been 2,600 years. All of a sudden, just like the scripture says, in one day you will become a nation. One day, the United Nations decided to give Israel back part of their land. 
And in doing so, they created a nation called Israel with a city called Jerusalem. And that was the first time in 2,600 years that Israel had their own land and weren't being dominated by any other empire or government in the world. Um, so when that happened, that started to set in motion um, a real dilemma between Persia and Israel. Now, Persia became Israel in 1979, April 1st, actually, of 1979. Persia was renamed Iran. And Iran declares that their mission is to wipe Israel off of the face of the earth. No more Israel on the map. They want it gone, they want the people gone, but primarily they want the land. It's really about the land. Now it's interesting um, what land is left of Israel. You know, when God um, laid out the land for them in the Bible, in Genesis, he, he gave them 300,000 square miles. I'll point that out in a few minutes on this little map. Now, that's a lot of land, okay? You know how much they have today? They have 8,000 square miles. So they have just a sliver of land, much smaller than what God had promised them, but they're coming back by the millions into their own land, into their own country, just as God told Ezekiel what happened. It's happening right before our eyes. This is all happening today. Now, um, if you've been watching the news, you see that Hamas, um, about a month ago or so, started launching rockets and missiles into Israel. At least they tried to. And um, almost all of them did not penetrate. I think there were close to 4,000 uh, rockets that they fired into Israel. And 90% of them were stopped or blocked by the Iron Dome, Israel's defense system, which is quite sophisticated. 10% um, of them did get through. And uh, the rest of them just fell in the Gaza Strip. Many of their own people were killed by these rockets. They're so um, old and antiquated and, and just inefficient that they couldn't do the job. Um, if you're watching this on TV, if you paid attention to this, you'll see what's happening. And it's, uh, it's quite exciting if you're a believer because these are the things that the Bible predicted would happen. Now, um, the war with Hamas a few weeks ago was all orchestrated by Iran. And uh, you can find all this on the internet. Um, it's not hearsay, it's, it's, it's real. It was all orchestrated by Iran. Iran was supplying all the missiles and rockets to Israel that were being shot in to, uh, to Hamas that were being shot into Israel. Then Iran started giving weapons and, and bombs and rockets, missiles to Syria and Lebanon, and they were firing them in from the north. So we had the southwest shore firing in rockets, and we had the north side of Israel being fired into. Uh, so the north was Lebanon and Syria, the south was Hamas at the Gaza Strip. And uh, it's all about the land. They want more land. They don't want Israel to have land. They don't want Israel to have a, a temple in Jerusalem. Um, that's their holy place as well. I mean, this is the center of the earth. When you watch anything regarding the Bible and you watch when uh, directions are given, did you know that everything is like is, Jerusalem is the very center? And if it says to the north, you look to the north. If it says to the east or the west or the south, you look from Israel and you'll see the countries that are being spoken about. And we're gonna look at that a little bit tonight because um, it's, it's very telling what's going on. Now, um, remember, Israel didn't become a nation until 1948. Long time, it was a long time. Um, so that was 2,500 years in the making. Now we're almost to 2,600 years. Now, what was written in the Bible 2,600 years ago? Ezekiel's probably writing this down saying, well, 
God, what nation is this? And why would they attack us? And, but Ezekiel was obedient, and he wrote what God told him to write. Even though he probably didn't understand why God was telling him these things. So, um, you can see Ezekiel 36, 37, and leading up to 38 being reported in the news today. Just check it out. Look at it. Look it up on the internet. See what's going on in Israel. See what's going on in the countries around them. And you can see these prophecies. I mean, it's like they're unfolding before our eyes. And I, I tell you this, and I say I take this little interlude away from the book of Revelation to talk about these things because this is something that immediately precedes the time when Christ calls us to be with him in heaven. Now, <clears throat> remember our, our graph, you have Christ here, the death, burial, and crucifixion, uh, resurrection. Uh, then we have the church age that we're living in right now. And so far, it's been 2,021 years. That's where we get uh, the year of our Lord from the time that Christ was crucified. Here I'm putting Ezekiel 38, not knowing exactly where it's going to be, but we know that it will likely be immediately preceding the tribulation. That's when we don't want to be here. We will probably be here for this other war of, that's called Gog and Magog. Look it up in Ezekiel chapter 38. Now, if you see this happen, if you see these countries coming to attack Israel, know that the time is very close. It's imminent. Um, and then we see here in Revelation chapter 4, all the believers being called up to heaven, okay? So, and then between that point and then the following seven years is what we call the tribulation period, uh, which God brings judgment to the earth and to the unbelieving people. Um, see here. Now, Iran should know by now that Israel has one of the very best defense systems on the face of the earth. Israel is in the top few of nuclear weaponry. Israel has great might and power. And there's no way that Iran could defeat them on their own, although they would try to, they want to. And what they did with this other uh, uh, war between Hamas and Israel on the Gaza Strip was they were trying to find the weak points in the Iron Dome. That's why they just gave them thousands of missiles to fire into Israel and see what, what would it take to defeat this Iron Dome. And so uh, they're figuring out a way that they can conquer them. Well, there's gonna be a lot more than that happening. Um, something I want to uh, remind you that the Bible said, it said, God watches over Israel. He says, we should pray for Israel. We should pray for Jerusalem. If you're a believer, you should be doing this. Um, he said he never sleeps nor slumbers. He's always watching for them. He's watching out for them. And another thing that the scripture tells us that I love is, if God is for us, who can be against us? And Israel is going to experience this firsthand. Now, Iran is just one example. Um, there's nations completely surrounding the, uh, the state of Israel that will be coming at this battle of Gog and Magog, which we don't know when it is because it's prophetic, but we have a very good uh, set of signs to be watching for, and it seems like a lot of those signs are happening today. So um, we're going to take a look at the map here and uh, see if I can kind of lay out and show you what is going on with these nations and... Uh, and then we'll come back and talk here for a moment, okay? Okay, I put this little map on my whiteboard here uh, to help us see uh, the things that are going on around Israel. Now, I wanna point out, Israel is this little blue sliver of land. They used to, when in the Bible, when God def defined it, it, was, it came all around here between the two great rivers and it came all the way down into Saudi Arabia and up through here and, and Egypt and all that. 
And uh, I have some other maps that I'll probably show you at another time in the future. But all of the nations that you see here in yellow are the ones mentioned directly in um, Ezekiel 38. And you see some of the others mentioned in other prophecies. Uh, Genesis, I'm sorry, um, Psalms 83 also talks about these nations. So you see between those two and other places in the scripture, these other lands. Now, you'll see them called other names like Put, that's Libya, uh, and up over in here, this is all part of uh, the land of Put. Uh, down here you have Cush, which is Sudan. Uh, you have Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, called out all the surrounding countries. Uh, the ones that will be leading this, however, will be one called Gomer, which is Russia, Turkey, which is called Beth Togomar in the scripture, and Persia, which is Iran today, okay? So these will be the leaders, and it talks about uh, the, the land coming in from the far north, okay? Here's Israel, you go far north, you hit Russia. You go north, you hit Turkey. And then these surrounding nations are also mentioned by name. So you see, <laughs> that little speck of blue is the nation of Israel. And it's surrounded by this vast amount of land and countries that are going to attack Israel. And how could they ever have a chance at that? Now, notice Egypt I've got in uh, like an orange color. Egypt isn't mentioned in these wars. It's, it's interesting. Will they remain friendly at this time? Will this be one of the lands that Jesus talked about when they will run and hide? Maybe this is one of the countries they will hide in. I don't know. But um, Egypt is not mentioned as one of the uh, enemies of Israel. But the, all these other surrounding countries are going to attack. They'll be led by um, this land called Magog. The leader is Gog. That's, those are names like prince or king. So the land is called Magog, and the leader is called Gog, when you look in the Bible. And uh, there are other writings that talk about this, some not even included in the Bible, like the book of Josephus. Uh, he'll talk about this, and he'll name these in greater detail. He'll talk about the Scythians coming down, and the Scythians were Russians. Okay, um, so that's kind of a, a little bit of an outline. I put over here in this note here, check out Genesis uh, chapter 10. Also uh, read Psalms 83, just for some more information and background on this, okay? All right, hold on just a second. Okay, just another, uh, what I consider interesting, I hope you do too. Um, so 73 years ago, this past May 14th, was the 73rd anniversary of Israel becoming a nation. Jesus said something along the lines of, this generation shall not pass before these things happen. Now a generation in the Old Testament was typically 80 years. 73 years, interesting, isn't it? Just based on that one comment by Jesus, it makes us think that the day is drawing near. It really does. Um, you know, when Israel became a nation, the land, that little sliver of land there, was desolate desert, basically. There was not much value in it. But since the Jews came back into that land and began developing it, it's become a beautiful land. They grow uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, citrus fruits, I think oranges, are, they're the biggest exporter to this part of the world over here with their citrus, uh, their oranges and those types of things. Um, they've built up this amazing army in this small little country that's been able to defend itself in battles and wars that it never should have won, like the Six Day War in 1967. How did they win that war? We'll talk about details of that maybe another time. I won't go into it because it'll take too long. But um, the interesting thing about all these countries that I showed you here in the yellow, never 
in the history of mankind, ever in recorded history, will you find all of these countries at the same time wanting to wipe Jerusalem and Israel off the face of the planet. You've got Russia sending weaponry into Syria. You've got, uh, as we mentioned already, Iran sending things to uh, missiles and weapons to um, Syria and to uh, uh, Lebanon, just on the north here. And um, even down here, it, these guys are called out Sudan and Libya as being enemies. Now, another interesting thing, these are all Muslim nations. And if you go back into the Old Testament, Abraham, before he had Isaac, who Jesus came through, that's the line that Jesus came through. Before that, Abraham decided he was going to do it another way. And he took his wife's handmaiden, as she was called, her name was Hagar, and got her pregnant because he thought, well, maybe this is it. And, and Sarah felt the same way. Why don't you just get her pregnant? She can have the son and we're good to go. Well, that's not what God wanted and that's not what he intended. He intended Abraham and Sarah, who were 90 and 100 when Isaac was born, to be past the age of being able to have children so that the people would understand that only God could have brought this child into the world. Well, they did it their way, and he had his firstborn son through Hagar, and his name was Ishmael. And that is where the Muslim nation has come from. And this is why the Muslims consider that little area on the map their holy place, the Jews, the Israelites, consider it their holy place, and even the Christians consider that a holy place. So there's a lot of competition between the Muslim nations and Israel. Okay, I want to read you a quick chat, uh, verse here, a couple of verses. This is in Luke 21. Think about global warming. Think about climate change. Think about all these things that are going on. You know, God is really in control. Uh, Bill Gates wants to launch some kind of balloons up in the sky that will uh, release some kind of ash that will dim the sun so that it doesn't warm the planet so much. Well, this guy's a nut. You know, there's a lot of nuts out there. Maybe I'm one of them. I don't know. But these are the things that are prophesied. Think about this. There will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars on the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Anybody think there's any perplexities going on in this world? I do. People will faint from terror when they start to see this, these wars and battles happening. I mean, they're just going to be so afraid because they have no escape. They'll be apprehensive of what is coming on the world for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. This is even going to affect heaven. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. In other words, get ready. Everything's going to start happening in this. Now, some of this may be talking about this part. After the seven years, Jesus returns. Because at this part, Jesus calls the church up. This is the, what we call the rapture. The, the scene that we saw in Revelation chapter 4, after the church age, which was this, he said, after these things, I heard a voice calling me, saying, come up here. I want to show you what, what must take place after these things. So that's when God calls the believers to heaven. Okay, Then you have the seven-year tribulation and judgment. Now, um, moving along here, I, want to, I don't want to keep you too long. Jesus told them the parable of the fig tree, okay? This is a, seems like a simple sounding parable, but it really says a lot about the days that are coming. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourself and know that summer is near. He's drawing an analogy, okay? Even so, when you see these things happening, the things that we've been discussing, Israel coming back into their land, these uh, countries around them wanting to annihilate them. 
get rid of them. Uh, all these things, when you, see the, when you see the trees budding, okay, you know the summer is near. We've just watched them bud out here in the last uh, few weeks. Now, he says, when these other things start happening, the time is near. So we need to be prepared. And I don't want to be like a, a guy that's trying to scare anybody into heaven because God loves you. He wants you to say, hey, I need the Savior. I, I don't know what the future might hold for me if I don't trust him. Now listen to this. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Okay? At the end of Revelation, you will hear Jesus say he's creating a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. The former things have all passed away except for his word, the Bible. That's why I'd like you to read it. Uh, listen to this. This follows up. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. You know, this pandemic, hey, that's like a test run for what is going to be required of us if you're here during the tribulation period. I don't think I'll go that far tonight, but we have to open our eyes and pay attention to what's going on around us. Addicted to everything but God. That's what the world's doing today. We're addicted to, you know, people are addicted to things they've always been addicted to, drugs or alcohol, uh, pornography, whatever it is. But those things we say, oh, I wouldn't do that. I don't know if you do or you don't. I hardly know a person who is not addicted to their cell phone. That thing is with us all the time. Some people sleep with it. People go to the bathroom with it. People have it with them all the time. If their battery dies, they panic. We're looking in the wrong place. Is the cell phone and that technology a great thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it can also be like an idol. We can't go anywhere without it. That's how God wants us to view him. Hey, I can't go anywhere without him. He's my protector. He's my savior. So, for it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch. And pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Now, when the church, the Christians, the believers, hopefully you're one of them, is called up to heaven by Jesus at that time, there's going to be the Bema seat of judgment. This is when Christ judges us for what we did for him. It's not, if you've accepted Jesus, you're going to be there. You're going to be in heaven. But he's going to be looking at what did we do while we were here. And you'll get your reward in heaven based upon that. The first step is just trusting Jesus as your Savior. And then, you know, studying the Bible, being involved with the church, and getting to know more about Christ will just automatically begin to transform you. Now, this is Psalm 83. Read the whole chapter, but I'm only going to read three verses. This is uh, verse 4 and then 17 and 18. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation. Okay? So that Israel's name is remembered no more. That's what these nations are saying. Hey, we want to make it like they never existed. We want them gone. Now, may they ever be ashamed and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. Let them know that you, whose name is the Lord, this is a psalmist, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. Okay, these kings and princes, they think they're in control, but God is in control. God is going to take things into his own hands. He's let the human race kind of uh, run the earth. He's allowed Satan to have almost like a free reign in the hearts and lives of people. And one day, he's going to say, time's up. You know, um, when Jesus was born, in the book of Galatians, it says, in the fullness of time, 
God sent his son. When the fullness of time comes and God says, hey, it's time he's going to send his son Jesus to call the church out of here. Can you imagine the chaos on the earth when millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people, maybe billions, are all of a sudden gone? Think about it. So we see God's plan unfolding right before our eyes. We see it happening. Um, we can see these last days coming. God says the last days will be when Israel is surrounded by their enemies. He says, we will see these things happen, and when we see them happen, be prepared for your redemption. You know, I can tell you how great a relationship with, is with Jesus and how much I love him and, and how much he can do for you, and you might think, well, that sounds kind of strange. It's something you have to experience. You really do have to experience it. You know, it sounds odd. Um, it, the Bible even says it's foolishness to those who aren't believers. And, um, but once you believe him and begin to see the real true power that he has in our lives to help us and, and uh, give us peace and joy, uh, you'll never want to turn back again. So I want you to be ready. I want you to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I want you to be saved from all of this that's going on, and more than I, God wants you to be. He says it's not his will that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance and have a relationship with him. God does not want you to stand condemned. He wants you to stand forgiven. And the way you're forgiven is to accept Jesus Christ by saying, Jesus, I know that I have sinned. I ask you to forgive my sin. And I know that you have the power to do that because you shed your blood on the cross and gave your life as a sacrifice for my sins. You rose again. And I believe with all my heart that you live in heaven with God your Father. So I accept you as my Lord and Savior. You could just Back up your video and go through that again. Pray that very thing. And tell him you want his forgiveness. You want his gift of salvation. You want to know him in a personal way. Um, we might be here for this battle of Gog and Magog, or it may happen right at the very beginning of the tribulation. It's really hard to say for sure. It's prophetic. It hasn't happened yet. We are putting together pieces uh, as Bible teachers to try to figure out when it could happen. God says no man knows the day or the hour. He doesn't even tell his son Jesus. Um, and I'll explain that in another video. But just to let you know, once this tribulation period begins, the believers are gone. There will be ways you can be saved during that time, but it'll be a death sentence if you do. And if you don't, it'll be an eternal death sentence. It won't be good. So, keep reading your Bible. Make sure you're trusting in Jesus as your Savior. And I pray that you have a great week. God bless you. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like and share these videos with your friends because they may make the difference for someone's eternity. So I trust that you'll do that. I thank you so much for watching. Have a great week and God bless you.